today designing modern board games based on George Philly's forthcoming book, A Class in Board Game Design, Lecture 12, More Mechanisms. We are describing coarse and fine graining, and this time we will start by describing a racing game. I'm going to record a few things, just a bit that I said already, because we are having educational camera games. We have a racing game with 12 positions and six teams. You take, players take turn drawing cards, and the cards say what happens to a car of a particular team, like move up three spaces, move back four spaces. There are six teams. You may draw a card up three spaces, and it's a card that refers to some other team. So you want to be a little clever about which cars you move up and which cars then get shifted back. And then there are amusing cards, for example, things like slipstreaming, where, yes, the yellow car gets to move up two spaces, and the two cars right behind it follow in its tail. So there are all sorts of amusing car arrangements. And this is a very crude, simple racing game. It's very clever. It's not crude in the design. It's crude in the amount of detail. Now, having said this is a racing game, one of the things you could imagine doing is to retheme it. For example, you could do horses or chariots. Or if you, some of you may remember an election for governor of California some years ago in which there were 100 candidates on the ballot. When we refer to it as a bedsheet ballot, this is meant quite literally. Interestingly, almost no one had problems finding their candidate, even though the ballots were printed in random order to avoid giving anyone an advantage. And you could imagine, this is a politics racing game. Who is going to get, say, the presidential nomination? And you have all sorts of amusing cards of good or bad, affecting one side, affecting your side. It's retheming, and it's the same game. So this is a very low resolution approach to describing a race. On the other hand, let us consider Bolide. This is another racing game. But this is a racing game which has physics mechanics at the velocity and acceleration level. So you are here and sitting ahead of you some number of spaces, as many as seven, is your velocity pawn. And the, I'll explain how you generate it, but the pawn shows where your velocity would take you if you didn't turn left or right or hit the accelerator or brakes. And there are very fine little squares. And when you actually make your move, you don't have to go here. You could go to anything two squares on any side of it. For example, you could choose to go here. So I make the move. And the first thing I do, now that I've made the move, I notice I have gone five spaces this way and two spaces that way. And I now know where my velocity pawn is going after I've done this. Namely, it's going five spaces out and two spaces to the side. And my allowed choices of move are determined by my current velocity, which could be sideways. So you notice you're actually controlling the speed of the car and the direction. <coughs> the resolution isn't infinite, but it's fairly large. This is also a game, if I recall correctly, in which the pieces are actually played on intersections, not squares, but it's a square grid. Now, where is the challenge here? Well, the challenge is that if the track does this, and I am pointed this way, I may have the embarrassing difficulty that all of the allowed spaces to which I can move give me a path that requires me to move through the spectators. This is not viewed with approval by most racing associations. And therefore, I have to plan my moves somewhat in advance, 
or there are negative outcomes. And since the maximum speed of the car is seven or eight, and the maximum change in the velocity is two, and some of the turns are quite sharp, I actually have to think about what I'm doing and start slowing down and turning and whatever somewhat in advance, or there will be a negative driving outcome. So that's bolide. That's fine grade. And you notice we move between coarse and fine. And as we do, there's more or less detail. There's more or less things you have to think about. Now, there are other ways you can do coarse and fine graining uh, in different sorts of games. I will take a Dungeons and Dragons example. We are going back to the original game. And in the original game, there were exactly three character classes. And uh, if you were a uh, magician, you were exactly the same as all other magicians. And one fine day, Peter Aronson, who, like me, was a member of the MIT SGS at the time, came up with the extremely ingenious idea that you could have specialists. And the, spe the notion of the specialist is you concentrate on doing X, and therefore you become really good at X. And the, the re However, the price is, since you're really good at X, you're not so good at Y. And he proposed the illusionist. And what we have just done for the um, D and D rules, which were remarkably vague in the original form, is we're going to add detail and resolution of a rational sort. That is, if you want to practice on something, you become better with it. Modestly later, there was the proposal of the gentleman of independent means whose prime requisite was money and who could use all of the skills of any of the character classes poorly. So no matter what you ask him to do, he could sort of do it, but not, or she could sort of do it, but not very well. So what, what is happening is you are adding resolution. Now, uh, Gary Gygax happened to be very fond of pole arms. For those of you who are unclear, a pole arm is a big, long stick with a giant can opener at the top. Well, they're not called can openers, but that's the idea. And they were deployed to deal with people who were wearing cans or armor, anyhow. And if Gary once did an article, this was in um, Domesday Book, which was the predecessor of Strategic Review, which was in turn the predecessor of Dragon, uh, if any of you ever find Domesday Book, they're extremely valuable in the sense if you find a set, it will pay your tuition for this course quite easily. Think 800 bucks a copy. Um, in any event, he was able to catalog 800, not 800, but 36 different types of pole arms. And of course, when these got stuck into the rules, let's add detailed resolution. Um, they all had slightly different properties. Um, ditto swords, all sorts of other sharp things. There was some criticism that is if you actually paid attention to um, real people in medieval times, they t tended to carry fairly conventionally designed swords of a fairly conventional length and weight. Uh, Roman legionaries carried a much shorter sword, Gladius, which was about a foot and a half. But they were trained to fight in tight formation with shields, uh, which is very different. Um, and gee, why doesn't the rule favor the weapon that actually works? So you can put detail in. It doesn't have to be accurate detail. Um, you could also say, well, we have this game. And instead of just having some rules that sort of establish the laws of nature, we could have rules that set out a complete world. Uh, and that was, oh, white bear, red bear, white moon, or empire of the petal throne, where the author had a conception of a world and politics. And that was certainly more detailed. There were also people at the same time who were doing detailed and counter descriptions. And one fine day, some enemy of humanity invented the module. And the notion of the module 
Uh, it's sort of like a first-person shooter, except it's done with paper, and you march through point A, point B, point C, no creativity involved, and this was for dungeon masters whose major objective was actually being personal disproof of Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, it was sort of negatively viewed. Uh, of course, you could do worlds that were a little less successful than others. Uh, there was al always the very beautifully created and well thought out, almost everything except one detail, city-state of the omnipotent overlord, um, except it was um, a somewhat dangerous place to be, so the correct move was we line up in a column, uh, whoever has the fireball wand starts throwing fireballs one after the next in front of us and we make a, a beeline to exit from the city. And if we run into any wandering monsters, they're sure to want to join us. Uh, so that's adding detail. It, city state, by the way, is a very nice thing if you could ever find it. Okay, so that's coarse and fine graining. And the main issue of coarse and fine graining is that you can do things at different level of detail and resolution, and as you do, you get different games. You've actually seen this now because first you played Carcassonne, where I could sort of tell you the rules in a few minutes. And then we, you played Puerto Rico, which I, where I could sort of tell you the rules in much of an hour. And now you've played Brass, and now that you've played Brass, if you play it again, you'll probably have some idea how the game works, right? Yes. Well, there is, by, there, by the way, there is a reason for that lesson, and the lesson is there is going to be a point at which you are going to be playtesting someone else's game. Now, some of the games will be much simpler than others, even though I did put all those constraints on them. However, it is a good idea to play the game at least twice or three times, the first time just to see if you figured out all of the amusing features, like what is the hand showing the hat? Um, what are those funny, um, are those funny, the squares with the little circles, are those chocolate chip factories? That would be, make some sense in chocolate chip cookie factories. No, there's something else. And after you've played the game, you've found most of the interesting rules, maybe even in time. Well, in some, in some, for some of you, I know it wasn't in time. You told me about it. But hey, that's why you play a game a few times before you have the rules down. And that's very positive. <clears throat> so in any event, I have now described coarse and fine graining which is a very important general sort of mechanism. It's about the most important single mechanism we're going to talk about. There are other things. <clears throat> Hidden information. Hidden information <clears throat> is the difference between chess or Go and many other games. If you're playing chess, all of the information about the game is right in front of you. You can see it. You have exactly the same information. Nonetheless, if any of you end up, if this is a really good bet, though I guess it could be wrong. If any of you end up in a game playing Judith Polgar, who was the best female player in the world, it is a really good bet that she will win and you will lose, especially if you put money on it. <clears throat> Honest. Um, and that doesn't matter. The information is there, but the uh, game analysis and what is going on in the players' heads is not. Um, on the other hand, there are games like bridge and poker. <coughs> and in bridge or poker, they're playing cards, and you don't see all of them. It's a hidden hand. It's like um, playing Carcassonne with hidden hand, except the game has been designed so you play it hidden and there is tools for attempting to figure out what the other people's hands are in part. And then, of course, in Bridge, one of the four hands, the dummy goes down on the table. And this is when players sometimes, oh dear, that isn't what we expected. Um, so the short form is um, <clears throat> if you play card games, hidden information gives you results. Um, another variation on this is what are called, in board war games, are called untried units. Um, 
if you were doing this in Dungeons and Dragons, you've discovered you need a large party of men, and since you have tons of cash, you hire them. Uh, however, the character sheets and details are face down, and thus some of these people will say they are absolutely brilliant swordsmen. You see, and um, they are brilliant. It takes a real genius to cut your own hand off with your own sword, and some of them are a little better than this, and some of them are really good. That's hidden information. Um, another variation is, of course, hidden terrain. And this is the basis of exploration. Uh, if you are attempting to find an exploration scheme that will give you maps that are well behaved, one choice is to think of Carcassonne. However, every single square shows open ocean with an island in the middle. And therefore, no matter what you put down on the board, there will be an island. And it will be a different island each time. This also works with starships and stars and solar systems. And because there are, there, the, it's ocean at the edges, everything matches. You don't have to worry about match. You just have to worry what you're going to discover when you go exploring. Okay. So that's hidden information. Hidden information introduces uncertainty. Uh, because you introduce uncertainty, and because, at least in bridge, you introduce um, G, attempting to read what the other players are thinking, um, you can be reasonably certain that um, the game is not a puzzle. It can't be solved because you don't know the unknown parts. Um, with some frequency, someone comes up with the bright idea of designing a poker-playing computer. Uh, if you have a poker playing computer that simply computes all the odds and knows what the right answer is given its hand, uh, and it is playing against a marginally competent poker player, this is not me. If we are playing poker, I will simply shorten the game. We will agree on how much I'm putting in, and I will just hand you the money. It's much faster and less painful for me. Um, however, the poker playing machine that just computes odds will always lose to a human player because it um, will not be um, han handling the fact that the other players are lying about their hands. A sophisticated com poker playing computer would not have this feature. I'm not sure if there are any of those. Okay, let us consider another mechanism. We'll push ahead. Connection games. The notion of connection games is that you are going to link A to B to C to D. Now, in fact, you played one yesterday. Brass is in part a connection game. You put down canals or you put down railroads. Um, the market is, um, is a little artificial in the sense if you decided that all you were going to do was build railroads, you might not get an optimal result in playing the game. Uh, historically, people who were railroad magnets and did a good job of it were very successful. I suppose the extreme example is the Northern Pacific Railroad, which was the one transcontinental built with completely private money. The guy who was building it surveyed everything very carefully. We'll add two miles of track if we can save 2% on grade. Grade is what costs money if you're moving railroads cross country. Um, and so people who just did railroads or steel mills as opposed to trying to do all of the above actually historically did pretty well. Nonetheless, you've played a connection game. I've mentioned Twixt. There are lots of games which are railroad construction games where you are just building a railroad. There are ones called crayon games because the map is surfaced with the fancy plastic you use the deletable crayon to draw your railroads. You very carefully clean the crayon off as soon as the game is done, because if you don't, you'll discover it ceases to be deletable with time. Uh, and it's a connection game of a different sort. Uh, some of you may want to look up Clipper. This is connecting islands to make money. Uh, an interesting variation on this rule is provided by Moscow Rails, 
where you open up a trade route, and the trade route, instead of, it's sort of like brass, actually, the trade route gives you money automatically. You are hauling stuff back and forth between A and B and C. The historically notorious version of this was the New England triangular trade, which was molasses from the British colonies in the Caribbean to right here. It's then turned into rum. Rum is shipped off to Africa. Afri from Africa to the colonies, it's slaves. This was a very bad thing that our ancestors did. Uh, but it's a permanent trade route. And um, if you, some of you will have heard of the House of Seven Gables book. Some of you. Mm, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, in any event, people who were successful on that or people who built clipper ships and went back and forth between here and China hauling tea one way and all sorts of stuff the other way got very rich. They really did. Oh, yes. I would be derelict if I did not mention ticket to ride. The notion of ticket to ride is sort of the opposite of these. Ticket to ride, you're a passenger and you're trying to line up all of the tickets that get you from A to B to C to D. Whenever I see this, I am reminded of the time when I was your age. I flew from Boston to Buffalo. There were five intervening landings, including in Worcester. You could fly from Boston to Worcester. I think they took the wheels up on the plane during that trip. OK. So those are connection games of different sorts. Let us push ahead and let us consider racing games. And there are all sorts of racing games. I suppose I should begin with the somewhat not quite notorious SPI, Air War. Uh, Air War was mostly people shooting at each other. However, it had a simulation of how an aircraft flew. It was a paper simulation, but it was as good as the computer simulations of vaguely the same period. Because you had to worry if you turned, for example, meaning you banked your aircraft, you lost kinetic energy because of drag, you lost speed. And if you lost too much speed, the airplane would no longer fly at a horizontal thing. It would fall. And if you did enough stupid things, you could do things, you could do amusing outcomes like getting into what is known as a flat spin where the aircraft is doing this. If you did this with a World War I aircraft, you should contemplate the fact that World War I pilots often did not have parachutes and this was about to be a career terminating situation unless you really knew what to do and were a good pilot. Uh, however, the, first, the very first air war scenario was you will fly in a circle and when you get back to the starting point, you will be at the same altitude, at the same speed, going in the same direction. Yes? And many players were actually able to pull this off without doing certain discouraged activities like taking the aircraft through large areas of uh, negative altitude relative to local ground. You do not want to do this with a real airplane. And so it was a racing game against yourself to see if you could manage to get back uh, without crashing. It, it was not quite trivial. However, there are bunches of other racing games. I mean, horses, cars, yachts. Um, we've talked about bunch, several car racing games. There are bunches of others. Uh, how many of you have played Civilization? OK, a bunch of you have played Civilization. The original Civilization was something of a racing game, and once someone got into the lead, dealing with the issue was extremely challenging. It was very hard to overcome the fact that someone was one space further down the track than anyone else was. Um, another game of the same sort is Parcheesi. OK, now a slight variation on games that are really about races are what I will describe as progress games. 
Uh, the, uh, an, uh, one archetypical progress game is Beowulf. Another archetypical progress game is um, the very old game of life. <coughs> the idea in Beowulf is you are duplicating the life of the hero. Oh, Beowulf is um, 10th century medieval, not quite medieval hist um, hero. He does such things as fighting, I suppose if I told you it was a Balrog, you'd get the idea. Then he has to fight the Balrog's mother, who is really dangerous, successfully. Um, and there are various variations on this. Um, but the general idea is you're born, you die, this is all certain. And the point of the progress game, it's not you're born and you die, it's what you do with your life along the way. And when you get to the far end, there is scoring based on how well you lived your life. There was a 60s game, I think it's not quite this one, where you did the same thing and the question is when you reached retirement age, which you all do in another 50 or 60 or some number of years, and maybe you'll even have paid off your student loans by then, but when you do reach retirement, the question is how well placed will you be? Will you end up in the poor house or will you have money to live on? You may correctly assume that as you approach my age, you will find this question much more interesting, even though the time to start saving is now. Well, having said that, the notion is it's a progress game. You chug along and see what happens. Oh, yes, amusing game. Though, as I recall, none of you are in BBT. Potential which is about taking biotechnology products, it's a race, and you turn them into viable products, and you take them through the development cycle. Of course, occasionally you take them through the development cycle, and it's absolutely a wonder drug, and it'll drop everyone's cholesterol to 130. Unfortunately, the patient drops dead three weeks later. This is a negative outcome. Um, <clears throat> But you try to take it around the cycle, which gets more and more expensive as you go on. And then there are various money-raising schemes, because instead of expending fuel to move around, as you would with a race car, you are going through money, potentially huge amounts of money. And if you are unlucky, you end up like um, various unfortunate people who went broke. And if you are lucky, you end up, if those of you who read the financial news, like Intercept Technology, whose price over the last year went from six to 400. You see, money. And that is a progress game. It is a racing game. You are trying to get from point A to point B. Now, the games don't have to be that sophisticated. They can be less sophisticated. Oh, yes, let's consider a different version of racing. Program movement. What am I thinking of when I say programmed movement? Well, the general notion, if we think back to bolide, is that instead of announcing what your move is going to be, you have to write down for several turns in advance what moves you're going to be. For example, yeah, you can put your foot down on the accelerator, but this is a 1910 car, and it takes a while to notice that you're feeding more fuel to the boiler and accelerate. This is not the Stanley steamer. Uh, so the, the sort of idea is you're going to say what is going to happen, but you have to say somewhat in advance. Um, sort of famous examples of this, more or less, would include Robo Rally and ricochet robot. And the point in these games is that you have various moves. 
and either you have to specify in advance or you have alternatives and you then have to carry this out. An amusing variation on this is space race. <coughs> you draw cards um, and the cards can go, in, go into the movement sequence and you have the choice of either storing a card or um, carrying it out immediately perhaps and your memory space for these moves is very limited. Of course, this is paper memory, not real computer memory. You don't have a terabyte hard disk. You have five cards that you can store. And um, at some point, you have to start carrying them out. And by saying you have to decide what you're going to do, well, you can play a card, you can put it down. You, they're very, you can imagine for different games, different variations on what you have to do. So that is Space Race. Um, another amusing variation on this is Techno Witches. Techno Witches could said, be said to be Harry Potter. However, these are American witches, not backwards British witches. They don't use broomsticks, they use vacuum cleaners. And you now have movement cards. I'm not sure I'm drawing these accurately. I only have the text description of different shapes. And you have the choice, if each time you pull out some piece that shows a movement card, you can either play it or store it in your spell book. However, the spell book only has a certain amount of storage in it, and at some point you're going to have to start playing something either from your, that you just drew or from your spell book, and life becomes more challenging. Closing thoughts since I mentioned Harry Potter. You are in the one, for what was at least for a very long time, the one city in the United States in which the author of Harry Potter appeared and did a book signing. This was back around book one. And it was at Technic Booksellers, which at the time was oh, down near Chant the, uh, the Foley Stadium. And so I looked at this and I blandly asked the young lady who was the store manager, so did you simply take out the entire Worcester police force as off-duty crowd control officers, or is the governor giving you the National Guard? And she looked at me as if I was nuts. The next week when I came in, they had started getting phone calls. People who were flying up from Florida to Worcester Airport, which at that time had passenger service, with their children to be at the signing, and they realized they had a serious issue. So in any event, we have discussed um, programmed movement, and we have discussed various things you can do with movement programming. We are kind of out of time, but there are plenty more mechanisms, so I am going to be talking about mechanisms for some time yet. After we do mechanisms, well, there's an exam, there's going to be a presentation. You guys, I, given copyright of likeness laws, I am not going to be taping that. Um, at some point, we are going to advance to board war games, which is sort of the aside while you're doing the serious work of developing your own games and discovering how hard it is to get something that's good and works. Nonetheless, I have talked. We are out of time. Class dismissed.